kindly carry on with your session. I will share the PPT, it's with me. Thank you so much. I um, mean, it really is an honor and you're right, absolutely right, Dr. Chitra, that this pandemic is terrible, but this online community and these conferences are such a joy in a very difficult time. Um, so I'm really pleased to be speaking at this conference on multiple dimensions of South Asian literary imagination, classic to contemporary. I've never been to Bhutan before, um, so it's, it's truly an honor. I want to thank you, Dr. S. Chitra and Dr. Jay Singh very warmly for the kind invitation. And it's actually the coronavirus pandemic that I want to talk about today. So please, could we have um, the slides? That would be great yes. if you could share sure. your screen. Here it is. Thank you. Yes. And if you could move to slide two, please. Yes. Next slide. Oh. Thank you. Brilliant. OK, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, I have slightly modified my title. So the title is Pericoronial peri Literature. Um, so I coined the term post-coronial to talk about this time that we're in and linking it with post-colonialism and world literature. But we're not in the post-coronial age yet. I want to talk about peri-coronial, which is around the virus before and after, and not just South Asia, also beyond South Asia a little bit. So I will be touching on Canada, South Africa, and the UK, but with a special focus on South Asia. Um, so please, could I have the next slide? Thank you. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to start by talking quite personally. I'm going to start with the personal and I'm going to move to the more general and, the, you know, the, the global discussion and the literary discussion. In the last few post-coronial months, I, like many others, have been poring over literature about dystopia or viruses. For me, an especially interesting example is the work of B.F. Patel. About the writer, little is known beyond the fact that he published the long poem, History of the Plague in Bombay in 1897. As I'm sure you know, between 1896 and 1902, an epidemic of bubonic plague had swept through Bombay and the surrounding area. The reactions of British colonizers to this outbreak of a medieval disease in the West Indian port city was calculatedly <coughs> woeful. An estimated 55,460 lives were lost in Bombay alone, and between 10.5 and 12.5 million people died from the disease across British India over the three decades around the turn of the 20th century. Yet only a handful of white Europeans were infected. This was due to the racist, segregative nature of colonial urban planning in India. And the fact that medicine in India was primarily geared towards the protection of British inhabitants. Alarmed by the epidemic, which he charts in verse replete with footnotes, these are the opening lines of Patel's poem. Please could you move to the next slide? The city was smiling in plenty and peace, contented her people and well at their ease. When in crept the plague like the serpent of old, dark author of slaughter and mischief untold. What terror, what panic now reigns in the land. Face to face against a foe, all unheard of they stand. A foe so mysterious, so subtle in his ways. Unchecked and unconquered, sad havoc he plays. It is these emotions of terror and panic that Patel evokes, which I want to address in the first section of this lecture in relation to our present moment. I'm also interested in another related feeling he fails to mention in relation to a widespread 
What a shock. When I consider the fact that I took a short trip to Pakistan in February and early March, which I do fairly often these days, so extraordinary it now seems, I imagine the self of that month as a shock absorber. So I'm going to use a bit of affect theory in this section to talk about shock, terror and panic. There's a stark contrast between the feelings of good cheer I had when traveling and in everyday interactions with friends and the ominous pandemic clouds that were gathering on the horizon. You could go back a slide, that would be great, please. Oh no, back. Next. No, back, two, two back, please. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Chambers, I, I will just interrupt once. I'm sorry for that. I request each and every participants kindly to mute yourself. Otherwise, if you can't sit, please remove yourself from the meeting because it's consistently creating intermittent noises. And the one before, please. Okay. Please mute yourself. It's a kind request. Perfect. Thank you. So I came to the Karachi Literature Festival on the 27th of February, 2020, the same day the first two home cases of COVID-19 were reported in Pakistan's media. One patient was being quarantined in Karachi and the other in Islamabad, the two cities I was going to. Both sufferers had come from the then badly affected neighboring country of Iran. My host in Pakistan learned about the outbreak while I was en route to Manchester for my flight. However, she didn't want to frighten me by mentioning it, which meant I was quite surprised by all the face masks and thermometers when I arrived at Jinnah International Airport. She filled me in on WhatsApp while I waited for my baggage. Bear in mind that the week before, my husband and our two teenage sons had gone to Northern Italy for a short skiing holiday. They came back full of stories about how quiet everything was. We didn't have to queue for the ski lift even once, they said. I had to break it to them that the deserted resort was probably due to fears about coronavirus rather than good luck on their part. News of Italy's devastating plague having just hit the British media. If they had even left it a few days later, I don't think my boys would have made it home for parts of Lombardy were about to hunker into lockdown. And before that, in late January, a Chinese student from my workplace, the University of York, had caught the virus while staying in a local hotel. His mother, also ill, was thought to be on a visit from China's Hubei province. This case was contained and the pair happily made a full recovery. However, by the time I set off for Karachi in late February, the UK had already confirmed towards 20 infections most of them through domestic transmission. All this would later have me questioning whether I might in fact be patient zero, this virus seeming to follow me round like a clingy toddler. At the time though, I was none too alarmed by the news of just two people in a country of Pakistan's size testing positive. It seemed inevitable by now that a few unlucky victims would be found in almost every nation. This is not to say we anticipated the scale of the spread. The news from Italy wasn't yet as dire as it would become. And the Far East had largely seemed to deal efficiently with their health crisis. At this point, for most people in both Euro-America and South Asia, coronavirus was a talking point rather than Armageddon. The general assumption was that it was a problem happening somewhere else even if a bottle of hand sanitizer was thoughtfully popped into each of the Karachi Literature Festival goodie bags, people were still hugging each other and social distancing hadn't even been heard of. These relaxed experiences chimed with a tale I heard several times. The story was recounted with particular pride at, with, at a dinner thrown for festival speakers at the new Karachi Police Museum. Karachi had fallen, so the legend went, from its position as one of the most dangerous cities in the world to low in the top 100 of metropolises vying for this questionable accolade. Certainly, there was a sense of cautious optimism and I felt well looked after. Indeed, 
looking back, there is the guilty sensation that like the British colonizers of the Bombay bubonic plague epidemic, I was segregated from the urban maelstrom, oblivious to what was really going on. But perhaps I am overplaying the optimism as despite all the conviviality, there was the faintest scent of panic in the sea salt air. A woman wearing a niqab who had been seated next to a female writer I know on a flight from Abu Dhabi, blithely told my friend the face covering had been protecting her from the virus for years. At the time, the writer took this as a reproof of her own uncovered head. However, with hindsight, it is the idea of modest clothing as PPE that is more striking. Just as the French have moved quickly from banning Muslim women's face coverings to mandating the wearing of masks in all public spaces for everyone, all our attitudes have done a swift about face this year. Moreover, about a week before my arrival, a toxic miasma had killed 14 in Karachi West. The government said this lethal gas came from soybean dust, but their explanation was widely suspected as a cover-up. Someone said, we've got pestilence, plague, and there's even been a swarm of locusts. And I shouldn't forget that I was fleeing the equally biblical storms that had swept through much of Britain in February. It had been a miserable month when viruses seemed far less pressing than climate change, as much of my island nation found itself underwater. Perhaps my relief at now being in Karachi's dry heat goes some way towards explaining why I didn't pay enough attention then to the signs of coming trouble. On the 2nd of March, I flew home, but only just. I was starting to sense the impending crisis. It was a good job I had booked with Pakistan International Airlines, PIA, because to my dismay, British Air Airways announced they were suspending all flights again to and from Pakistan. Three weeks later, things were really starting to unravel. The friend I had stayed with called to say she'd fallen sick with some ominous symptoms, dry cough, temperature, lack of taste, sense of taste and smell. When I relayed these to my husband, a family doctor, he told me it sounded like coronavirus. My friend and I were in shock. The virus was a news story, not something ordinary people caught. The next thing that would happen to me in England was that our younger son, aged 13, had fallen sick. Again, we think this was coronavirus, but in the UK of March, there were few tests. This time, the shock reverberated through my body, making me unable to sleep or concentrate well. Another shock was the change to both our working practices. As York's graduate chair, I was responsible for helping international students evacuate from the highly contagious country of Britain, as well as being involved in moving all teaching online. Meanwhile, as a doctor, my husband was seconded one day a week to work in a hot site for COVID patients. On the other days, his face-to-face -face consultations with patients shifted to video calls. This work was what at once terrifying and tedious. In her work of affect or emotion theory, Ugly Feelings, 2005, Cyan Nagay is interested in unglamorous emotions such as disgust and irritation. Her penultimate chapter, Stupilimity, discusses this unusual word, a portmanteau term incorporating stupor and the sublime which she has coined to discuss, quote, a synthesis of boredom and shock, end quote. Shock is usually perceived as purely traumatic and dramatic, but Nagai points out it's simultaneously banal. So she says, and I quote, it is conveyed through a drastic slowdown of language, a rhetorical enactment of its fatigue, end quote. In other words, stuplimity is an emotion closer to shock and bore than the vaunted coupling of shock and awe. As a friend wrote to me early in lockdown, it's like a disaster movie, but a really, really boring one where everyone is just massively confused and fixated on paracetamol and toilet roll. 
When I call myself and many other people living through 2020 shock absorbers then, it isn't something edgy or sensational, but rather dull. We are more like car parts trying to get a grip as we absorb bump after bump. Could we have the next slide, please? Yes. Sure. And the one after that, please. Thank you. As I say, when this pandemic really took hold and went global, I was blindsided. And so now I want to talk a little bit about literature and reading and theory and how this can help us to think through this problem. One of the books I turned to was Pakistani novelist Mohsin Hamid's 2007 novel, The Reluctant Fundamentalist. In this novel, if you could please move to the next slide, the protagonist, Changez, declares, I had previously derived comfort from my firm's exhortations to focus intensely on work. But now I saw that in this constant striving to realize a future, no thought was given to the critical personal and political issues that affect one's emotional present. In other words, my blinders were coming off and I was dazzled and rendered immobile by the sudden broadening of my arc of vision. This resonates with how I feel about the pandemic and the fast moving emotional present in general and my loved one's health in particular. I usually throw myself into my research, te teaching and editorial work. But in the first three months with my son ill and with worries about my parents and my mother-in-law, plus a friend who was bereaved, I suffered a series of personal and professional crises that left me overwhelmed by the situation's enormity. Indeed, I was unable for some time to do any reading or writing. I know I wasn't alone in experiencing writer's block at the beginning of this lockdown. I benefited from an illuminating and curiously uplifting article published in early April by Aisha S. Ahmed, an academic who is no stranger to danger and puts the current health crisis in the context of other emergencies. Ahmed wrote, in a way that helped my paralysis no longer to worry me. So could we have the next slide, please? The legacy of this pandemic will live with us for years, perhaps decades to come. It will change the way we move, build, learn and connect. There is simply no way that our lives will resume as if this had never happened. And so, while it may feel, find good, feel good in the moment, it is foolish to dive into a frenzy of activity or obsess about your scholarly productivity right now. That is denial and delusion. Your first few days and weeks in a crisis are when I would focus on food, family, friends, and maybe fitness. Her recommendation that you should focus all your attention at the early phase of any crisis in looking after your mental and physical health and securing your family and your home is sound advice. It is nothing to feel guilty about if it's un impossible to concentrate on reading, writing or other creative or intellectual tasks at this time. The present plague took many people by surprise dazzling and rendering us immobile. To be sure, sober warnings had come from China and other countries in East Asia. However, as Ipek Demir shows, these harbingers were underestimated by a complacent and ethnocentric West, whose pride was fueled by what she calls epidemiological neoliberalism. The current dystopian situation feels like Kali Yuga, or at least the beginning of the world's end. Things should slowly return to some semblance of normality, but to adapt the title of um, a collection, an anthology of women's writing, which was about post 9-11 Pakistani women, there is no doubting that the world has changed. COVID's metamorphoses are entrenching inequalities in ways that will be difficult to reverse. Far from being a leveller, this crisis is widening already vast social chasms. Take the gender pay gap. The pandemic is likely to set female academics back 
by decades and calcify gender inequalities in higher education because of the emotional labor and caring burdens women tend to shoulder. The virus itself and subsequent lockdowns lay bare the fault lines of social injustice that structure our world. Writing in The Guardian in April, Stefan Collini shone a spotlight on universities' ruthless and pervasive use of insecure contracts. Holders of these temporary contracts are usually women who are cheaper and more expendable than their male colleagues. Collini calls this group the academic precariat. Amid the scramble to move undergraduate teaching online, the struggle for a just dispensation for this precariat is being undermined now more than ever before. As student numbers fall, zero hour contract holders will be forced to do even more work for less or will lose their jobs altogether. Put differently, universities are cynically using this crisis to streamline the already austerity pummeled higher education sector and to make swinging expenditure cuts. In Precarious Life, The Powers of Mourning and Violence, 2004, Judith Butler gives readers a detailed understanding of precarity and the precaria. Precarity is commonly and rightly associated with social class, being widely interpreted as vulnerability, another word of which Butler is fond. She characterizes precarity and vulnerability as being embodied, alluding to the precarity of bodies, our rupturable skin and easily failing organs in ways that find new echoes in the time of coronavirus. She further emphasizes humans' sociability connect us to other bodies within relational networks, demonstrating the interdependence interdependence of all human beings and the fallacy of individualism. Butler writes as follows. Please, could you have the next slide? You make me and your loss undoes me. It is not as if an I exists independently over here and then simply loses a you over there, especially if the attachment to you is part of what composes who I am. Who am I without you? So there she's really pointing to the individualism of many in the West, particularly where we have this illusion that we are autonomous when we're in fact, we're created by others. And she also shows that we experience mourning and grief in the face of the loss of that other whom we love and without whom we do not exist in the same way. The term precaria is popular in academia, especially for discussing the vulnerability of those whom Amitabh Kumar, writing about the US context in his book, World Bank Literature, calls adjunct faculty. These are the early career lecturers highlighted by Collini who work from contract to contract with no sick pay, holiday wage or future assurance. Butler's concept of precarity might also be extended to encompass our present corona crisis with the British government's identification of extremely vulnerable people for shielding, as well as the unprecedented threat the virus poses to existing and future jobs or careers. Anyone experiencing severe anxieties around sudden unemployment or potential homelessness might be seen as part of the academic precariat worldwide. It is also important to note that when the virus strikes, it is people from impoverished and minoritized areas the world over who are dying at higher rates than those able to shelter at home in more privileged places. In Britain, Bain, black minority, sorry, black, Asian and minority ethnic people are dying at exponentially higher rates during, due to a complex nexus of poverty, social class, lack of access to healthcare and occupation ties, among other factors. As the head of Bradford's QED Foundation, Muhammad Ali puts it, they said that COVID-19 does not discriminate. That was clearly not true. The pandemic makes plain the unequal access to resources various groups and individuals have. 
in Singapore, which was initially held up as a great COVID success story for its contact tracing and virus con containment, it emerged that those who are dying are overwhelmingly minorities. The so-called success relies on ignoring the country's 300,000 migrant laborers who live amid quasi-segregated, crowded conditions in foreign worker dormitories. There was a huge resurgence of the virus because this precariat was never look, looked after. And many of the new cases came from this vulnerable group. Something similar happened with migrant workers from South Asia in the oil-rich states of the Arabian Gulf. The virus exposes and magnifies the usually ignored fact that the elite benefit from structural inequalities on which their countries rest. At an excellent online conference on our post-coronavirus future, organized by Om Prakash Devedi at Oro University in Gujarat, the Indian novelist and politician Shashi Tharoor gave one of the keynote addresses. Presenting the example of Narendra Modi, Tarot observed that in countries where strong men are in office, these populists have used this virus to shore up further power. The human consequence is increased fear of the other, where there is a marked and widespread hostility to entire communities, such as the Chinese or anyone who looks East Asian. Tarot rightly poured opprobrium on the toxic hatred many right-wing Hindus have been showing towards Muslims. An ill-advised meeting held by the proselytizing Tablighi Jamaat movement in March has been used as a stick to beat Muslims with for spreading illness. However, the BJP also held a big gathering around that time, so this is selective outrage. Indian politics is severely infected by religious hatred, and communal tension has been escalating in areas where people, most people never imagined this could happen. One of my friends in India said, it, even if the country manages to escape the worst excesses of COVID-19, India is now doomed to live with this virus of communal hatred. Next slide, please. Moving next to the realm of peri-colonial fiction. Um, so, fiction around before and after this coronavirus crisis. On March, 19, March 10th, Kamala Shamsi started the hashtag COVID reading list, where people online shared reading plans for any lockdown or quarantine situation. Should it surprise us or come as no surprise that many of the titles recommended by the general public belong to the genre of dystopian fiction? For me too, dystopian writing is both a tonic and a guide when it comes to imagining and understanding our current coronial destruction to lives and livelihoods and imagining our post-coronial future. In her collection of essays, In Other Worlds, Science Fiction and the Human Imagination, Margaret Atwood coins the portmanteau term, Ustopia. This brings together the utopia and dystopia categories because Atwood argues like yin and yang, one contain, contains the germ of the other. As Butler was saying, you can't have one without the other. You know, things are not isolated. Atwood doesn't really unpack the us in utopia. However, that collective pronoun of society its breakdown and an ineffable relationality between humans is the focal point for many non-Western Ustopian authors. The notion of Ubuntu, meaning a person is a person through other people, emanates from Southern Africa, but has Pan-African resonance. Similarly, in Islam, a Hadith makes it clear that the Muslim community is interconnected like a person's body. The Hadith says, if, a head, if the head aches, the whole body aches. As this emphasis on pain makes clear, how interconnected we are is double-edged, especially as a time of crisis such as this one, where we can easily feel, feel the pain of others. Peri-colonial, utopian authors expand the notion of togetherness beyond the confines of one's continent or religious group. They examine the corporeal closeness of all human beings 
and the consequent need for social justice or just plain justice on a global scale. Taking Mohsin Hamid again, because he's a brilliant writer of dystopian fiction. In his Ustopian novel, Exit West, for example, there are scenes that appear to have nothing to do with the main narrative arc. There is a sudden shift to a different location and new characters before a jump cut back to the primary plot. Such snapshots evoke a planetary snarl up of lives and in a mostly bleak novel, foster an alloyed optimism about interactions between white, brown and black people in a future landscape to emerge after the apocalypse. Hamid also gives us the following quote. That's the next slide, please. It might seem odd that in cities teetering at the edge of the abyss, young people still go to class. But that is the way of things with cities as with life. For one minute, we are pottering about our errands as usual. And the next, we are dying. And our eternally impending ending does not put a stop to our transient beginnings and middles until the instant when it does. I think this reads very differently. He wrote that in 2017, but reading it in 2020, it also serves as an illuminating description of the strange reality and simultaneous triviality to these surreal and historic times we are living through. In her brilliant new monograph, Contemporary Women's Post-Apocalyptic Fiction, Susan Watkins single out Bina Shah's, Pakistani writer Bina Shah's Before She Sleeps as an important post-colonial dystopian novel. Watkins summarizes the te text thus, quote, set in a repressive Southwest Asian country, a nuclear war has caused a genetic mutation that causes a deadly type of cervical cancer to kill millions of women, end quote. The mutation that Bina Shah envisages has selectively killed off most women. However, what we're seeing with the coronavirus is it's not discriminatory. It hurts everyone, including Britain's Prime Minister, Health Secretary and Chief Medical Officer, including the richest nations of the world, um, nations like Britain um, and America, which have been badly hit. This leveling effect is something Shah says she didn't consider when she wrote the novel, but the pandemic does showcase, of course, social inequalities that I've talked about in that rich people can pay for private testing and get better care. They may also cocoon themselves in the safe, comfortable homes without worrying too much about domestic violence, looming unemployment or being unhoused. The poor have no such luxury. In South African author Lauren Buke's short story, Internal Architecture, the, catast the catastrophe is not a virus, but an impact event. Riffing on Stephen Ling's theory of edge work, Buke writes that the asteroid strike she imagines on Cape Town has a positive outcome for some survivors of, quote, finding yourself or finding understanding that the world is blunt mechanics, but also that there is magic in that if you can push yourself far enough to see it, end quote. Yet Bukes also delves into what she calls the undercity of the homeless and the refugees and the drug addicts and the dispossessed. These undercity dwellers have no hopes of epiphany amid their desperate quest to survive. The cliff edge road ahead is bumpy and our view of it fogged. Yet I would argue that these pericolonial Ustopian writers provide some relief with the crystalline clarity of their roadmaps. Next slide, please. So I want to conclude by talking about literature's contribution, um, which I would suggest could be something around empathy rather than empty gestures. In the early days, many hailed the pandemic as a great equalizer. The we're all in this together rhetoric was deafening. That was before it was discovered that death rates were highest among minorities and low income groups, before layoffs ruined many. 
before it came out that American billionaires and other disaster capitalists became half a trillion richer during the pandemic. As Janet Wilson, Om Prakash Devedi, and Christina Gomez Fernandez put it in an editorial, this is the next slide, please. Among the perplexed, some even denying and slow moving governmental machineries, COVID-19 heightens new and unprecedented forms of precarity in terms of the medical and human resources urgently needed to fight it, and the anticipated economic recession which will follow, amplifying the already existing great divide between rich and poor, global south and global north, haves and haves nots. That the equalizing rhetoric existed makes it evident that our human abilities to put ourselves in each other's shoes and practice empathy are severely compromised. The philosopher Martha Nussbaum might see this as a failure of the moral imagination, something she connects to literature, empathy and social justice. Reading is supposed to give a people a perspective into the lives of others. Nussbaum was one of the Indian Nobel Prize winning economists Amartya Sen's collaborators on the capability approach. This approach favours a holistic perspective on human development and allows for core human needs to be addressed. Inequalities are easily legible in socio-economic conditions and must be rectified. Much of what is written under the sign of world literature today, including Anglophone South Asian literature, the focus of much of my research, tends to position itself as a vehicle for that empathy which makes human rights possible. Here are questions about who is characterized as human, the violence borders enact on people's lives, how inequalities come about and their consequences. It is worth grappling with the problem of uncritical empathy in the global literary marketplace commodifying world literature. After all, there is a thin line between world literature that creates productive empathy for others and world literature that is complicit in an imperialist narrative. This is part of a larger problem with the idea of writing as testimony. Indeed, there is a history of literature about oppression in foreign places to justify imperialist agendas most recently to justify US intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan. Books such as Malala Yousafzai's I Am Malala, Khaled Hosseini's Afghanistan novels, or Iranian Azir Nafsizi's Re Reading Lolita in Tehran can be co-opted to promote neo-imperialist capitalist agendas, promoting intervention regardless of their author's intention. So, the discussion around COVID reveals deep inequalities. These inequalities lie behind the public policy insistence on maintaining the economic focus for the sake of low income workers, despite a critical and crippled healthcare system. They are also apparent in how a consumer culture in affluent parts has not been harmed very much. It is resolved by now that the pandemic is the opposite of an equalizer. Unless we address inequalities, any crisis will make them worse. In 2020, two major women writers of colour, Zadie Smith and Arundhati Roy, published essay collections about the global SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and our tumultuous times more broadly. Zadie Smith brought out intimations in late July. It is a collection of six essays about the present cataclysmic year, whose royalties she donates to the Equal Justice Initiative and the COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund for New York. In a postscript, Smith writes that the racism, social injustice and lack of civil rights against which Black Lives Matter campaigns are a kind of violence, virus, sorry, unseen, contagious and hard to recover from. For Smith, her primary interest beyond the interlinked issues of health and wealth is Black Lives Matter and fighting the virus of racism. Just over a month later, in early September 2020, Arundhati Roy published Azadi, Freedom, Fascism, Fiction. Here, the author of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, 2017, is concerned with India's ruling BJP. She excoriates the BJP's Discriminatory Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA, 
a national register of citizens, CR, NRC, as well as their vi vicious abandonment of first in information reports, FIRs, in JNK, Jammu and Kashmir. A chilling alphabet suit of violence as Modi uses COVID-19 to shore up his proto-dictatorship. Just as Smith calls racism a virus, Roy writes of fascism and fake news in virological terms. She says they are spreading like an epidemic and blossoming in the popular imagination like a brain deadening malignancy, end quote. And in future research, I want to examine Smith and Roy's writerly in attempts to inoculate against the diseases of racism and Hindutva. Although very different in approach and tone, both authors discuss their story universes, writing and linguistic politics, making a defense of in increasingly beleaguered commons across the world. They do this through Intimations, the title of Smith's book, and Roy's sixth chapter, Intimations of an Ending, intimately hinting at solutions rather than always mounting full frontal attacks. I think that these two books represent the first real works of post-coronial literature in what seems likely to be an outpouring of books about the COVID crisis over the coming years. These times demand active empathy at the highest level, empathy that is apparent in our actions. Only that, rather than empty gestures, will come close to being any kind of equaliser. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for this very, uh, very insightful uh, reflection. And also, it's so relatable to all of us, uh, though you also brought in so many countries. But I think in whichever part we are sitting, it's so relatable because uh, somewhere, somewhat, we are all experiencing that how uh, the already existing problems of racism, communal riots, Islamophobia, uh, geographical racism and several other dimensions which are already existing which are obviously nothing new to us they're just getting reconfigured and remanufactured through this uh through this time of covid 19 as if uh, they are kind of from like the the chronology is gradually uh transmuting into something which is called which we can often call as a coronology as if through coronavirus a new logic is you know taking birth of you know, a new system is taking birth through which we can further the existing parameters of violence that are very much embedded within our social structures. And it's it's so much relatable with respect to the examples that you brought through South Africa and other parts of the world. And uh, so I was just wondering, I mean, since we don't have any, so far we don't have any question in the, in the chat box, I was just thinking of, uh, you know, putting forth a question in, in front. So, I mean, obviously, within the academic space, we uh, we discuss a lot about uh, these aspects. We we write papers, we uh, we reflect, we talk about. Uh, but when we go into the 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 space of praxis, uh, praxis, for instance, right standing in the social center, when we go into venture into that space, we we altogether encounter a different different kind of challenges which are often not possible to understand or map when we sit and verbally engage or we theoretically engage so as an as an individual as a as a professor as a reflector as a thinker i mean what could be the possible how to how to create this awareness amongst the common people for instance those who never understand about terminologies like post colonial decolonial pericolonial or whatever how how, what are the some of the possibilities? What some possible initiatives we can take? Obviously, with respect to our respective geographical, social positionalities, to create awareness amongst the common people, to not to believe in fake news, for instance, not to believe in fake videos, for instance, not to uh, fall into the trap of propagandism, for instance, that we see is kind of increasing day by day through this particular. Uh, through the time of this COVID-19. So if you can share some thoughts uh, about it, it would be wonderful. Thank you. 
Sorry. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I like what you said about old problems being reconfigured and the way um, COVID um, is allowing prejudices to mutate just as a virus mutates. And that's really interesting. I agree with you that in, you know, academic spaces, you know, the jargon of academia can feel like a big um, disjuncture. So between theory and praxis, um, it can sometimes feel as a huge chas chasm. I would say that there is, in, in answer to the first part of your question, I don't think there's much point in trying to kind of spread words like pericoronial or post-colonial around particularly. I think talking about the issues in accessible language though, so not trying to get people to read Judith Butler on the street, um, you know, everybody, you know, we find this interesting, but it might, it's not gonna be even, very highly intelligent people like my husband, who's a doctor, would not be very interested in these kind of discussions. But you can talk to people on the level of, you know, inequality. Everybody has a stake in justice, social justice. Is the virus a leveler? Are we being lied to? Um, we are being lied to, but you're absolutely right. The second part of your question is much more difficult to answer about fake news, because this really is a scourge. Um, and it's spreading, it's spreading the virus and it's spreading misinformation and fear and hatred. So I think that that truly is um, something we do have to tackle. And I think we should be trying to talk in different fora. So I agree with your underlying sort of assumption, which is we shouldn't only be, you know, using the advantage of these Zoom, you know, communities you know, to do high level conferences like this one. My feeling is we should also be out there um, doing things on the ground. So, you know, I, I like doing, you know, creative writing um, with real beginners in Bradford. I've been doing workshops in Bradford, Glasgow, Sheffield and Leeds. Um, this is ordinary people who wouldn't want to talk about um, Butler or precarity or, you know, some of this jargon. And I don't want to talk about it with them, but what they can do is everybody has a story to tell. And that might be an oral story. And it may just be for catharsis to feel better about telling the story of your illness, like I did in my first part of the lecture. These reflections, they seem simple, but they are complex. And if somebody can tell that story, they might begin to make sense of it. And then they might be less susceptible to misinformation that is out there. I mean, that's just, my thoughts, this is all such, we're in fast moving time, so it's difficult to say, but I, I do think that working with, with ordinary people as well as in university situations is a really good idea. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, pr Professor, for this, your, your reflections. And I think uh, there, is a, there is a question, which I guess is a continuity of what you just said in connection with my question, I, I just put forth. Uh, so, Mr. Himanshu Kumar asks that, uh, would you say that the pandemic acted as a catalyst to bring out what we actually are, especially during the time of lockdown? I think that's a brilliant way of putting it. Yes, absolutely. And it links with the other question on the chat from Jay Kapoor about, do I see a deepening of the racial divide in my own society and social environment, similar to what I think is projected in Arundhati Roy and, and Tarot? I absolutely agree. Like, so I didn't, I didn't want to bore you with Britain too much because this is a conference about South Asia, but here things are very bad. And I touched on the fact that black um, and Asian minority ethnic and poor people here are suffering far, far more and hatred is being whipped up. Um, Islamophobia here is, uh, is at its highest ever. There have been horrible hate attacks on women wearing hijab, men with beards. Um, so we know that the police stop and search, um, especially young Asian men, you know, 10 times more than young white men. Um, the, the, the rhetoric from our tabloids is despicable and disgusting. And Zadie Smith um, being born in Britain and she's, she's been in, the new, in New York for the last several years. She has lots of brilliant things to say in intimations about 
the inequalities and the hatred in both those countries of America and Britain. So I do think in, re in reply to Professor Kumar um, that the pandemic is a catalyst. Issue. We're all showing our true colors. You know, Britain and America are showing their condescension and their imperialist tendencies and their greed, frankly. Um, in India, um, communalism that had been accelerating a lot, especially um, 2014, 2019, you know, these elections, um, it is it is now ramped up even more. We're all we're all showing our true colours. Pakistan is another case um, where a laissez-faire approach, um, you know, is, is disguising that the virus is swirling around and the, the number of deaths is far, far higher than it's being reported. So, you know, I don't think there's a happy story here. Um, and I'm not trying to sweep under the rug the problems in Britain, which are very severe and very shameful. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for your reflections. And uh, I think we don't have any other question. Uh, there was a question from Jaya Kapoor, which you have like answered in connection with uh, Mr. Kumar's question. Um, so, uh, if, if there are no other questions, I would like to uh, sincerely request uh, Dr. Chitra to take, take over. Yeah. Thank you, Sayan. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, Sayan, for taking up this question and answer session. And I, I, should, I have to acknowledge uh, Professor Claire Chambers from the bottom of my heart. So thank you so much for this brilliant lecture by transforming the reading. You have given us a different way to read the text by pulling evidences from South Asia, pointing out the multiple layers and the varieties of text, not only from post-colonial to post-coronial, but also pre-coronial and post-coronial. The comparison that you have come up with has uh, given us the input for further research in this topic. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be in this session with you all. I request the presenters to carry on with their presentation in the respective uh, parallel session that is scheduled at 3, 3 p.m. 3 to 4 p.m. Indian time, 3.30 to 4.30 in the IST. There are two parallel sessions, one in Zoom and one in WeChat. Uh, I earnestly request all the participants to please join. Thank you all for making this session wonderful. And there will be, again, uh, tomorrow's session, there will be speakers joining at 9 a.m. Bhutan time and 8.30 Indian time. I request all the participants to be there and to uh, enrich yourself with fruitful learning by listening to the speakers and their views and insights. Thank you.